Ah, what we're going to be talking about today are the required nutrients for plants to grow in aquaponics. Now, these are the same nutrients that are required no matter what the growing method is, whether it's soil, hydroponics, aeroponics, making up aponics, it doesn't matter. It's the same nutrients that are required for plants to develop, but our focus here is on aquaponics, so we're going to be touching on the aquaponic aspect of it. Now, with that being said, this is important for the aquaponic grower to know. This is the fundamentals of aquaponics. You must know what the plant needs in order to supply it. If you don't know what the plant needs, how can you supply the proper nutrients to it for it to grow? It's important to know these things so you can uh, identify deficiencies in your plants and you can make sure that they're growing adequately or there's adequate uh, nutrients in the solution for them to develop properly. Now, with that being said, naturally occurring elements, there's about 92 of them that are present. When you include the, the elements that are synthesized by man or made by man, there's about, I think, about 118 of them. But the naturally occurring elements, there's about 92 of them. Out of these 92 naturally occurring elements, you get about 60 of them found in plant material. 60 of them have been found in plant, uh, plant material. And then this is in Dr. Um, Howard Reich's book, uh, Hydroponic Plant Production. You can read about it in there. But the reason why there's so many elements that have been found in plants is because they don't have a mechanism that could um, uh, distinguish between a non-essential element or an essential element. So they're taking up pretty much anything that's dissolved in the soil or in the water solution, they're going to take it up. They don't discriminate. So there's probably other, well, there, there is other reasons behind that that we don't understand as of now, but all we know is that they don't discriminate, which is why you'll find um, uh, plants used as filtration in a lot of wastewater treatments. They're going to remove all those things, elements that are inside of the water. They're going to take them up. So like I said, there's non-essential elements, those that are not required for plant development. Plants will still take those up. Like lead, they'll take it up. And if it's concentrated high enough in the plant tissue and consumed by humans, then you can have some harmful effects. So it's important to know what the heck is inside of your system. It's important to know that. Then we have the essential elements, those that are required for plant development. That's what we're focused on right now. Now, what determines if an element is essential or non-essential? That's what we're going to touch on now. Uh, there's a scientist by the name of D.I. Arnon and P.R. Stout. In, the in 1939, they're the ones who came up with pretty much the, the uh, three criteria that determine if an element is essential for plant development or if it's not, if it's just in the way. And uh, that's in a paper called, um, what is it called? The Essentiality of uh, Certain Elements uh, in Minute Quantities for Plant Development with a Special Reference to Copper. They wrote that in 1939, and that's pretty much what all the textbooks that I have, they pretty much go off of the same criteria. So the first criteria, um, uh, what they came up with, is a deficiency of it makes it impossible for plants to complete the vegetative or reproductive stage of its life cycle. Now it says a deficiency of it. The it meaning is a deficiency of this element, a particular element. It makes it impossible for the plant to complete its vegetative stage. The vegetative stage is basically after germination. When it pops up, it's like the baby coming out of the womb when it's there. From there and it begins to grow and develop. You, you know, as a reference to a, like a kid and then becomes a teenager and an adult. That's the growth stage, the vegetative stage. You know, it comes, it, it pops out and it germinates. Then it, it gets its first set of uh, true leaves. And then from there it begins to develop. The leaves begin to develop and it begins to grow on. That's the vegetative stage. And the reproductive stage is pretty much when it begins to develop its flowers and produce fruit and seeds or going to seed as uh, some of you may know it as. That's the reproductive stage. If it does not have this particular element, it cannot complete those stages. It's extremely important to know this. Extremely important to know this. That's the first criteria. The second criteria is such deficiency is specific to the element in question and can be prevented or corrected only by supplying this element. So it says such deficiency, let's say for instance, we have uh, intervenal chlorosis or yellowing in between the veins of the newer growth, the newer plant tissue. That deficiency, according to this criteria, can only or can be prevented or corrected by a particular element being supplied. And we know this to be iron. 
If iron is lacking in the system, this deficiency will occur. If it is supplied adequately, this deficiency will be corrected or it can be prevented. So we know that iron is essential for this particular um, deficiency. That's what this is saying. Now let's go on to the criteria number three. The element is directly involved in the nutrition of the plant as opposed to making a nutrient more available. So it says the element is directly involved as opposed to being indirectly involved in the plant nutrition. You got elements like cobalt, which assist in accelerating nitrogen fixation. Plants being able to take uh, atmospheric nitrogen and converting it into nitrogen that can be used in uh, the processes of plant development. It can accelerate that process, but it's not the actual nutrient that is being used. The nutrient being used is the nitrogen. So cobalt, therefore, is not essential. It doesn't meet that. It's trying to sneak its way in there, but it doesn't meet the criteria. Cobalt, you got to get out of here. So that's what's going on here. These are the three criteria that are pretty much um, uh, put together and used for uh, the vast majority of people, uh, uh, scientists who are going and working uh, on plant nutrition. You can read about it in a few uh, other books. Mineral of Higher Plants by uh, Petra Marshner. They talk about it in there as well. So these are the three criteria. Now, with that being said, let's go inside of the plant material and find out the essential elements that are required. Let's get a little bit deeper in there. Let's find out what's going on inside the plant and causing it and allowing it to develop uh, to its proper state and to maturity. So let's get in here and start talking about it. We're going to go into the plant material. Plant material. Excuse the writing. It's going to get the job done though. So plant material. The first thing that you're going to notice inside of the plant material is that between 80 and 95 percent of this plant material is what? Water. It is water. The vast majority of that fresh leaf that you're eating on is going to be water. Well, some of you guys ain't eating on fresh leaves. You're eating at Walmart vegetables, and those things don't have anything in them. But for a healthy plant, one that we're going to find in aquaponics paradise or for a high-class grower, you're going to have your stuff between 80 and 95% water. Now, this is going to depend on uh, the turgidity, turgidity, of the plant and the turgidity is just basically uh, the water pressure against the cell walls. Water is going in there and is being uh, uh, exerting pressure against the wall. This is exactly what's causing the plants to stand upright and appear stiff. Basically it's swelling up the plant. That's the turgidity of it. So depending on the turgidity of it, that's going to determine uh, where, in, where this falls between this 80 and 95 percent of the water. You can come out at certain times of the day in the morning time, then you're going to have pretty much a lot of turgidity in the plant. A lot of pressure against the cell wall because it's not having to exert uh, or stress itself and it's not transpiring as much. So a lot of the water is still being held in the plant. But if you come on a hot sunny day when the plant is transpiring uh, uh, a lot, then it's going to be pretty flaccid or wilting. So it's not going to hold as much water. But if you catch it, like I like to catch it, I like to catch mine in the, in the morning or in the evening. The winter time, I can catch it any time right now, and it's going to pretty, pretty, be pretty turgid. It's still going to be pretty swollen in the winter time. In the summertime, ooh, I have to select. If I come out and catch it in the heat of the day, man, I don't even want to eat it. So I got to wait till the evening time or catch it right in the morning uh, before that hot sun comes out. So this is what's, uh, what, uh, what it basically breaks down to, the turgidity of it. Now, when you take the plant material and you want to do a sample, a plant tissue analysis, what you're going to find out is that they dry it. It's going to be dried at 70 degrees Celsius or about 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is going to be dried for a period of 24 to 48 hours. 24 to 48 hours. I'm going to get ready to change colors. 24 to 48 hours. And what we're going to come to find out 
is that during this drying period, between, between, between 10 and 20 percent of the initial weight is going to be dry matter. The dry matter is going to consist of about 20 to 10 to 20 percent of what it initially weighed. Why? Because most of that water has evaporated out when in the drying process. Most of it has evaporated out. So we're left with about 10 to 20 percent. So for example, let's say our plant material, let's say for example, this is just a hypothetical scenario. Let's say our plant material, our initial weight is 10 grams. 10 grams initial weight for the plant that's being sampled. We know that between 10 and 20 percent of this initial weight is going to be left after it's dried. So we'll say, for instance, we'll say, let's pick a number, let's say 16 percent. Let's say we dried it, most of the water evaporated, that 80 to 95 percent water, it evaporated and it left us with let's say 16% dry material. That 16% of this 10 grams, let's find out what that is. So we have our 10 gram initial weight times our 16%, 0 0.16. That's gonna give us uh, 1.6 grams of what? Of the dry weight. Dry weight. 1.6 grams of the dry weight. Now, here's the, the thing that's surprising out of this 1.6 grams. Let me change the color real quick. Here's the thing that's surprising. Out of this 1.6 grams, 90% of it, 90% of this consists of three elements. Carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen make up 90% of that dried weight, showing you that these guys take up, I call these the big hogs. These guys wanna take up all the space. They take up all the space, and it's the same thing in uh, pretty much all living organisms. Not, uh, a vast majority of it is gonna be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The vast majority of living organisms. And when you add nitrogen on there, it's going to be like 96%, those four elements. But these three elements take up about 90% in this dried plant tissue. This is pretty crazy here. So when we break this down further, our 90%, we have 1.6 grams of the dry weight. That's what we were left with, the dry weight, after we dried it, and then um, times... 0 0.9, we know that 90% of that um, is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and that's going to leave us with 1.44 grams. 1.44 grams of this dry weight, of this 1.6 grams of dry weight, is going to be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which leaves us, should we change the color on them? Let's change the color on them. Let's go to, let's pick a color, which leaves us with 10% for the remaining, the remaining, remaining 13 essential nutrients. 13 essential nutrients. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, they take up the vast majority and they say you guys can have the rest. The 13 other nutrients that are required, y'all can take up the rest. That's what's going on here. So we see that here. So we have a total, come down here, we have a total of 16 essential elements. 16 essential elements are required for plant development. And these 16 essential elements they're broken down into macro and micronutrients. We'll go into that right now. And these are arbitrarily divided into macro and micronutrients, meaning that somebody just made it up. Somebody's winging it. That's what that means. So we have micronutrients, and then we have our 
or macronutrients, I'm sorry, and then we have our micronutrients. Our micronutrients. We'll start with the macronutrients. Let's give us a little bit more room on here. We'll start with our macronutrients, and we'll change the color for this real quick. Let's go into, uh, uh, let's do an orange. So the first macronutrient that we're going to have is carbon. C. Where are we going to get this from? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. CO2. Atmospheric CO2. That's where we're going to get this from. The next one is going to be hydrogen. Hydrogen, which is H. And then we have oxygen, which is O. Where are we going to get both of these from? You guessed it. Water, H2O. The hydrogen uh, atom is here, and then we have two atoms of oxygen there. This is in the water. This is where the plant is going to get this from. Next, we have what? Nitrogen. Nitrogen, which is N. Now, we know that in aquaponics, we have three, or you can look at it as four shared forms of nitrogen in aquaponics. We know that we have ammonia, or NH3, uh, which is the gaseous state of ammonia, and then we have um, uh, the, uh, the ionic state, which is ammonium. As the gas uh, contacts the water, that's when it gets converted into ammonium, the ammonium ion. Then also we have nitrite and then nitrate, and these three uh, make up the nitrification process. So this is where we're going to get this, and where we're going to get our nitrogen from? Primarily from the fish feed, right? We're going to get this from the fish feed. Let's get a little bit more room. What else do we have? Phos phosphorus. I almost couldn't spell that. Phosphorus which is, uh, I'm, what am I thinking? S. Let me get, let me change this out real quick. It's S. Phosphorus is S. Where are we going to get that from? The feed. After phosphorus, we have potassium. Oh. I don't know what happened there. Let me remove that. We have potassium. Potassium, which is K. Where are we going to get potassium from? We're going to get this from our pH supplementation. That's where it's going to come from. When you're correcting your pH in aquaponics, you can supply it using potassium. After potassium, what do we have? We have calcium. Calcium, which is Ca. Calcium, we're also going to get this from pH. Also, we can get uh, calcium from the source water. Depending on uh, if you have hard water, there's calcium ions that are in there that will be supplied to the plant as well. Also, what we have is sulfur, which is S. That's going to come from the feed. And then we have magnesium, which is Mg. And this is going to come from, this can come from a variety of sources. It could come from pH supplementation. It could come from the water source, and then uh, it can also it also comes from the feed. So it depends on uh, if you might have water that is hard. Once again, it has magnesium ions in here as well. So these here are the macronutrients. Lead, these are required in relatively large quantities for plants to develop, and these are going to be a primary concern in aquaponics. If you're going to have any problem. In aqua, uh, aquaponics, it's pretty much going to be right around here. The potassium, calcium, and the magnesium. These guys right here are uh, pretty much competing for the same site um, within the, uh, the plant cell. So sometimes you might have an excess amount of potassium, which could cause problems with calcium. These three all are, are, are interlocked amongst each other. Too much magnesium could cause a deficiency in calcium and potassium. Too much potassium could cause a deficiency in calcium and magnesium. These guys are locked in there. So these three are right here uh, are um, very important to keep an eye on um, in aquaponics. Now let's move over to the micronutrients. These are required in relatively small amounts. 
relatively small amounts. Now, what I want you to understand is that although these are required in relatively small amounts, that doesn't mean they're any less significant than the macronutrients. Because once again, what did we go through? The criteria is if, if any one of these are missing, the plant cannot complete the vegetative or reproductive stage in its life cycle. So it doesn't matter if it's a macronutrient or a micronutrient because some of these micronutrients, these guys are required in so much, such a small amount that it's like, what are you even doing in the plant? What are you doing in there? But it's required. Don't let it be in there and that plant's not gonna make it. So what are we gonna start off with? Iron. We're gonna start off with iron, which is F-E. And we're going to get this in a chelated form. Iron is insufficient in fish feed. Therefore, we have to supplement it. It has to be supplemented. There's no other way around this as of now. Iron precipitates, uh, uh, it, it precipitates quickly at a solution if you don't have it in a chelated form. So we have to put it in a chelated form in order for it to stay in solution and be taken up by the plants. All right? So after iron, we have chlorine, which is Cl. And this is going to be supplied in the feed. After chlorine, we have manganese. I think it's uh, manganese is Mn, which is coming from the feed. After that, we have big bad boron, boron, which is B. That is coming from the feed. After boron, we have what? Zinc, which is Z-N. That's also coming from the feed in aquaponics. After zinc, we have copper. C-U, that is coming from the feed. And then after copper, we have molybdenum which is M-O, and that is coming from the feed, ladies and gentlemen. So once again, these are the micronutrients needed in trace amounts, small amounts. Some of these guys, I think copper may be required in like 0.0001%, something like that is made up of that uh, in, the plant, in, in the plant tissue. Something that's just so small but yet again, if you don't have copper in there, that plant's not going to make it. This is an essential element, although it's required in trace amounts. So this is pretty much what is going on in uh, the plant uh, tissue and what is needed in order for the plant to develop through the various stages. If you're lacking any one of these, then you're going to have problems in aquaponics. A lot of people do have problems because they don't understand what is essential for the plant to grow. It's not just nitrogen or nitrate that is not what it is you a lot of people will uh um are under the assumption that 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 is what it is that it's just nitrate ammonia nitrite and nitrate but that's not the case there's 16 essential all of them are just as important and you can see there's a deeper esoteric meaning in here if you have an ear and you can hear that many things that someone may find insignificant are just as important as the things that you find significant Everything plays its role in the macrocosm and the microcosm. Everything plays a role. Everything does. So with that being said, this is the breakdown of what's going on inside of the plant. These are the nutrients that are required for the plants to develop. Hopefully you've got an understanding and from here we can work and go on further and we can start understanding more in depth of some of these nutrients and how they're working within the plant. It's very, very important as an aquaponic grower, the scientist, the high class grower. You got to understand these things in order to understand how your system is functioning, how it's functioning, why some of the things aren't functioning properly and why things are working properly. This will give you kind of like an overview of the nutrition that's required for plants to develop. This is very important. This is the fundamentals of aquaponics, the basics. You must know this dealing with hydroponics or aquaponics and even aquaculture. When you start dealing with this, mineral nutrients are very important. So hopefully this has helped uh, you guys out there, and from there we'll be going into other subjects. But with that being said, this is Brooklyn, St. Michael with the School of Aquaponics.
reminding you to stop walking and get you a car.